The definition of a stupid economic idea is one that is immune to empirical refutation while being useful to specific constituencies. So what's a good one? So have a look at that slide there. That's real. Sovereign borrower of the year, 2007, the Hellenic Republic of Greece. Right, that's that actually, that shit actually happened, right? <laughs> now, I wrote a book in 2013 called Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea. You should all read it if you haven't already, it's a classic. And uh, basically I got interested in this because the European Commission started to take seriously what I thought was the most stupid economic idea I'd ever heard of, which is called expansionary fiscal contraction. Now, if you're basically going to have the public sec private sector deleveraging and the public sector deleveraging at the same time, and everybody's everyone else's trading partner and you all use the same currency, then the only thing that can happen is you will have a contractionary fiscal contraction. But they began to tell the story that there was going to be an expansionary one. Now, the story behind this is brilliant. So that the everyday homily, of course, is the family budget and the state's budget. They're really just the same thing. So the family runs out of money, you stop spending, you tighten your belt, all that sort of stuff, right? And of course, the state's budget is completely different. Number one, families don't get to issue their own money. Families don't get to bring people into the family and then tax them for five generations. I mean, there's actually slight differences here. But the really big one on this is what I call the IKEA problem. And this is how, if you'd strip away all the econometrics of what this idea actually says, expansion of fiscal contraction. So you're in, let's say, Spain or Portugal. It's 2009, 2010. The economy's falling about your ears. You might have a job, but your wife works in the public sector, so you know pff, that one's going. Now, in a micro level, you want to tighten your belt, right? Which, of course, if everybody does it, is bad, because that's because of the contraction. But you also know this idea called expansionary fiscal contraction. And you go, wait a minute, I just read in the newspaper that the government's going to slash the welfare state by 50%. Yes, this is perfect. See, using my rational expectations, I then calculate my lifetime income given the fact that this credible commitment to cut the budget has now come out. Recalculating it in this way, I know that my future tax burden 25 years from now will be much lower than I anticipated. Therefore, I've got so much more money now, I run out to Ikea and buy a couch, so does everybody else, and we cure the recession before it starts. That's actually a real idea. It also informed easy policy from 2009 through 2011. That's one stupid idea. Here's another one, Japan. Eric Lonergan at MNG, some of you might know him, very smart bloke, produced these two little charts. Japanese public debt, it's terrible, look, 200, oh my goodness, blah, 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 it's the worst thing, and we're all gonna go the same way, and it's all terrible, we're all gonna die of debt, forget, nobody's ever died of debt, but never mind. So anyway, they got 200. Well, it depends how you look at it. If you look over there, what you see is basically the government in Japan has been buying government bonds. So if you do a net calculation and then you look at how much of the issues since 2010 they've been buying, you drop way below 100 really quickly. And they're generating inflation. So why are they trying to do that when nominal GDP hasn't dropped and also the labor market is functioning relatively well? You're doing it because you're doing it as an intergenerational wealth transfer because you've got an old society with too many assets and you want to basically burn those assets. Think about it this way, if I owe myself a mortgage and then I buy the mortgage back for myself, do I have any debt? <laughs> the inflation puzzle. There's a fake king, Sweden. There's a fake economist, Milton. <laughs> and why is it? It's a head fake, but it's a real fake. There's no inflation anywhere. We were all raised on monetary theories of inflation. The 1970s is this very small end in the world, but we've generalized everything from. We were just talking about this. And it's very interesting. You've got 13 trillion in long-dated debt on the long end of the curve, 13 trillion in central bank intervention. And if you wipe the 70s out of your sample and go all the way back to 1350, I'll show you this in a minute, the long-run real rate of interest for the globe is about 1.5%. And what matters for inflation isn't money. Milton was wrong. It's labor power. Because if you have closed national economies and you have your own cash and you target full employment and you have strong labor protections, you will generate an inflation. You can get it through the import channel, Brexit's gonna do that to Britain, etc. But the classic inflations in the 1970s come from a very specific institutional configuration which now no longer exists.